Jack Legs Diamond was one of the most notorious mobsters during the Prohibition era. Jack Legs Diamond was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, but moved to New York along with his father and brother, Eddie, when his mother died of tuberculosis. He became a prominent figure in American organized crime during the 1920s and early 1930s. They said that Legs Diamond was as popular in New York as Al Capone was in Chicago. Legs Diamond became a mentor for some of the younger generation of mobsters, such as Salvatore Lucania better known as Lucky Luciano, and Arthur Flegenheimer better known as Dutch Schultz. Legs Diamond had a reputation for double-crossing partners or hijacking their booze shipments, eventually he ran out of partners. Legs Diamond and Dutch Schultz became bitter enemies as a result of Diamond's treachery and they went to war with each other. Diamond survived several attempts on his life throughout his criminal career, earning him the nickname the Clay Pigeon of the Underworld, having 81 shotgun pellets lodged in him and numerous other bullets. This photo was taken before Jack Diamond surrendered to police for questioning in the aftermath of the shooting at the Hotsi Totsi Club at 1721 Broadway, between 54 and 55th Streets in New York City. The Hotsi Totsi Club was owned by Legs Diamond and his partner Charles Entrada or Charles Green as he was also known. Charles Entrada was said by some to be Diamond's bodyguard but it appears that he was Diamond's partner in the club. An argument broke out in the club one night. One man, Simon Walker died after being shot in the head and another. William Red Cassidy died later in hospital after being shot three times in the back. Peter Cassidy, Red's brother, was injured when he was shot twice, in the melee in which 15 shots were fired. One of the staff cooperated with the police and became a witness, which meant some of the other staff had to be whacked so they couldn't confirm what the witness had seen. One by one, Tommy Ribbler and Jaime Cohen were never seen or heard of again. William Wolgus's body turned up riddled with bullets. Diamond had sent his brother Eddie to Colorado because New York was too hot and could relieve Eddie's tuberculosis. Rothstein had a hit team dispatched to Colorado who had been following Eddie for a few weeks before the hit. However, a series of events happened that would change gangland. On the 4th of November 1928, Arnold Rothstein was fatally shot. The following day, the 5th of November, there was an attempted hit on Eddie Diamond in Colorado, Eddie survived and the gunman, Jean Moran a former Rothstein employee, and Joseph Pitio, a Dutch Schultz gunman, got away and skipped $5,000 bail. Arnold Rothstein died the following day, the 6th of November. Although the media linked Legs Diamond to the murder of Rothstein, an unconnected man named George Hump McManus would eventually stand trial and be acquitted of his murder. That series of events sparked reprisals. In March 1929, Frank Blubber Devlin, who was the driver of the hit team in Colorado, was found shot dead. In August, Jean Moran's charred remains were found in his burned car. He had been shot to death. In September, James Baddow's body was found in a car. He had been shot three times. Baddow was believed to be Jean Moran's killer. Two days later, Tommy Ahern's body was found, and he was named as another of Jean Moran's killers. November saw Mortimer Schubert's body being found. Schubert had been burned with cigars and torches, his ear cut off and six bullets in him. Schubert was also named as one of Jean Moran's killers. And finally on the 10th of January 1930, Harry Vesey, a Rothstein associate, was found shot to death in his car in New Jersey. Vesey was the suspect in the murder of Frank Blubber Devlin. Another murder that happened in March 1929, the murder of Thomas Fatty Walsh, initially appeared to be connected to the other murders. But it turned out that there was a different motive in Walsh's murder. For much of this series of events, both Entrada and Legs Diamond were in hiding, Entrada however was caught in Chicago, 
taken back to New York, brought to trial, and acquitted with a lack of evidence. However, there was still no sign of Legs Diamond anywhere. He eventually deemed it safe enough to come out of hiding after the witnesses had been taken care of and surrendered to the police for questioning. He posed outside the police station to prove he had no marks on him before he went in. Jack Diamond's criminal career came to an end when he was shot and killed in Albany, New York, on December 18, 1931 the same day he had been found not guilty in court. Because of his treacherous ways, Gangland widely snubbed Diamond's funeral thus depriving him of the gangster's lavish funerals that were popular during the 1920s often attracting thousands of mourners and curious onlookers and large floral bouquets worth thousands of dollars. Legs Diamond's wife Alice Kenny Diamond was also murdered sometime after his death, her murder was also never solved. Charles Entrada or Green was murdered in July 1931. A gunman burst into his office and began firing at him. Suddenly two more gunmen ran in and all three emptied their guns into Entrada. It is believed that it was revenge for the murder of William Red Cassidy at the Hotsi Totsi Club. Thomas Fatty Walsh was a gambler, mobster, associate of Dutch Schultz, and good friends with Lucky Luciano. He now reportedly haunts the Biltmore Hotel, in Miami, Florida. Fatty Walsh was a former bodyguard of Arnold Rothstein. When Arnold Rothstein was murdered, Walsh along with other infamous mobsters, Jack Legs Diamond, Lucky Luciano, and George Uffner was taken in for questioning regarding the murder, they were all released though. Thomas Fatty Walsh had quit working for Rothstein two weeks previous to the murder as he said Rothstein was too cheap. Fatty Walsh and Jean Moran parted ways with Diamond after the death of Rothstein. It was a partnership that didn't last long however. Jean Moran would be taken for a ride by gangsters and his bullet-ridden charred remains were found in his burning car. In March 1929, Fatty Walsh was murdered in a hotel room in the Biltmore Hotel in Florida, and another man, a former Diamond gangster, Arthur L. Clark, was wounded but he refused to talk to the police, nor would he even speak of Walsh, I don't care to talk, would be his answers to questions. The investigation suggests that the entire floor of the Biltmore Hotel was rented to a man named Carl Gaylord. Whether Carl Gaylord was a real person remains unknown, it was likely a cover name for someone else. Both Walsh and Clark were employees of Gaylord and not registered as guests at the hotel. It said that an illegal speakeasy and casino was being operated in all six rooms on the 14th floor of the Biltmore Hotel in Florida. Hotel workers would report that fashionably dressed people would make their way to and from that hotel floor. On the night of the murder of Fatty Walsh, gunfire broke out in one of the rooms at 12.45 a.m. killing Walsh and wounding Clark in the side and arm. When police arrived they found the hotel floor deserted and an open door. Police found the body of Walsh and an injured Clark lying on the floor groaning. Police would not arrest anyone in connection with the incident. A man named Eddie Wilson was believed to have been the shooter. An arrest warrant was issued for him, but none were ever charged for the murder. Some witnesses say that Fatty Walsh owed money to Eddie Wilson. 
Wilson confronted Walsh about the money and Fatty Walsh began to mock the way Wilson spoke, with a lisp. This enraged Wilson who opened fire and then ran away. A few other theories emerged. One connected the murder to Rothstein's murder in New York a few months earlier. Another claimed Walsh got whacked over a bootleg liquor deal gone south. A recent shipment of rye whiskey was stolen and Walsh was said to be one of three men behind the heist, leaving one investor out of pocket to the tune of $175,000. Legs Diamond, in an exclusive interview with the New York Daily News in 1931, refutes any claims that Walsh's death had anything to do with him or Eddie. Interestingly, Diamond denies that it was Walsh or Jean Moran who shot at Eddie Diamond in Colorado. He would also say about Jean Moran, he was neither my friend nor my enemy. In the aftermath of the Hotsi Totsi Club shootings, where an argument broke out in the club, one man died after being shot in the head and another died later in hospital after being shot three times in the back. The Hotsi Totsi Club shootings were the start of a series of murders that shocked New York. Three months after the shooting police were still looking for Legs Diamond, officials, and the media were putting pressure on police to solve the case. Running out of ideas they decided to pay Diamond's old friend Charles Lucky Luciano a visit. Luciano and Diamond had met each other sometime in the early to mid-1920s. They were friends and both had worked for Arnold Rothstein. Luciano was ahead of his time and didn't mind working with criminals from other ethnic backgrounds. This kind of thinking would come to be important in Luciano's later years. Luciano also ran clubs and speakeasies on Broadway. According to author Patrick Downey in the book Legs Diamond, Gangster. On October 16, 1929 as Luciano left a racetrack and was going to a house he owned in the Bronx, he pulled his car into the garage of the house, as he pulled the door of the garage down he was grabbed by a couple of big detectives, who had tailed him from the racetrack. The detectives threw Luciano against the wall of the garage and frisked him. I'm pretty sure they were cops the minute I saw them, Luciano would recount years later. Then a car with two more guys pulls up to the curb. Each one of them takes hold of an arm and hustles me into the car and throws me face down in the back. While he was in the back of the car Luciano said his hands were tied behind his back and tape placed over his eyes and mouth. Then the detectives proceeded to beat and question him as to where Legs Diamond was. Luciano told them he hadn't seen Diamond for over a year, needless to say. The detectives weren't happy with his answers so they beat him some more and kept questioning him. After a few hours the detectives came to the conclusion that Luciano wasn't going to give anything up. They took a ferry ride to Staten Island where they dumped a semi-conscious Luciano on the beach. When he regained his senses Luciano began to make his way home. However, he met a policeman whom Luciano offered $50 to call him a taxi and leave him be. The officer refused and brought him to the hospital, where he was questioned further about grand larceny of an automobile and pursuit from police, that happened a month prior, supposedly with Eddie Diamond in the car. Luciano gave a statement that he had been picked up by rival mobsters in a limo and beaten. The newspapers picked up on the story, saying he had survived a one-way ride. The truth is, Luciano was not taken for a ride by rival gangsters. In his words, a gang ride ended one way, dead. This is where some of the myths about Luciano began. He did not get his scarred face from being hung up by his thumbs, stabbed, and slashed, as some news reports have claimed. and he didn't get the nickname Lucky from surviving the ride, as others have claimed. He was already known to police as Lucky by the time this incident occurred.
Frank Costello once said, I never heard anyone call him lucky. Not even behind his back. We called him Charlie. The older guys called him Salvatore. On the street they called him Charlie Lucky. A few short years after this photo was taken, three of the four men would be dead, Eddie and Legs Diamond and Fatty Walsh. Charles Lucky Luciano would go on to become legendary. Luciano is credited with creating the modern-day mafia and founding one of the most iconic mafia families, the Luciano family, which included Frank Costello and Vito Genovese as his consigliere and underboss. Vito Genovese would eventually succeed Luciano and Costello, which would change the family name to Genovese family, the Ivy League of organized crime. Luciano, however, was sent to prison and then deported from the United States. Luciano went into exile in Italy where he died in 1962 at the age of 64.